ShireSociety.com. I just realized that last shot, that was the first Havenstein sign I've seen here in Bedford, and I've seen probably 10 Hemingway signs. I'm speaking only about the, the Bedford polling place, not the, the, the town in general. A lot of people tend to treat a primary as though it's not all that important. Uh, they don't vote there. And it turn out here will probably be only about 20%. But um, the way I look at it, that's where the real democracy occurs, if there is any in the U.S., it tends to be in the primary, because that's when you get all the real people running, right? After the primary, sometimes you just end up with a couple of suits running against each other for the general election. Although, it's not so much that case in the, uh, in the state house. I'm standing here with, who am I standing here with? Jim Bernard from Bedford, New Hampshire. Mr. Bernard, thanks for talking to me. Uh, you've been uh, carrying this sign that got my attention because I know it will get my viewers, viewers' attention. People are very interested in GMOs. It's a huge, hot button issue right now. But you were in the middle of actually telling me something when I started running the camera, so I should probably let you finish. You had, you had a thought with, relate, with regard to? Well, with libertarian uh, values, what, in, what intrigues me most is uh, there seems to be a reluctance on the part of people that are liberty oriented or libertarian in nature to be to think that we should have for some reason not a right to know what's in that box of food that we're buying at the grocery store you know and it's just kind of stupefying because for me it's a absolute you know liberty libertarian issue because we should have basic human rights of honest transactions, when whether it's we, we go to the grocery store, we go to the doctor's office, we go to a lawyer's office, or we go to the bank. On all our regular business relationships, we expect to have a certain expectation of fair trade. See, this is the genius of New Hampshire, is that I'll have a question, and someone else, I'll think I'll have it all to myself, and someone else will think of it for me, and you have essentially done that. Uh, in the sense that I was going to ask you, more or less, you know, why should taxpayers be forced to underwrite, you know, labeling enforcement and so forth. Well, the, the the fascinating thing to me is that there is no essentially cost to the consumer because if we all have fair and honest dealings with our suppliers, vendors, and and the people we conduct our business with, uh, then then there really is no cost because when you think about it, in terms of what's on a box at the grocery store. The next time they print the labels, it was it cost fifty dollars or twenty five dollars for a graphic designer to just change the label? So well, there's really no cost to the consumer here in the, terms of labeling. Here are the costs I see off the top of my head, not even being in that corporate world, but presumably they're going to have to have different labels in different states, and that can cause huge logistical issues for a company. And additionally, there's an enforcement cost. You know, if a company is not complying properly, then you have to spend taxpayer dollars going after them. They're going to have big lawyers. They're going to defend themselves. And again, I'm having to pay for it. And shouldn't I be solving the problem instead of having the government solving the problem? Well, no, you, you, you raise interesting questions. Uh, but I'll take the one where it's, let's say, enforcement's less say. Uh, the long and the short of it is what we're talking about is honesty in conducting business. Now, any business that wants to conduct a dishonest business, and you can look at any major institution in the United States right now, and one could argue that they're perhaps not are, you know, uh, conducting business in the most ethical fashion. So enforcement where there's dishonesty will always be a problem for any society. But an honest business would have no problem disclosing with their co customer, if it's an honest relationship, what it is they're selling. I mean, it always comes back down to who's doing the enforcing. Government's susceptible to all kinds of corruption. It can only enforce with taxpayer dollars at, at, at the way it's set up now. Or, or do you envision some way that a government might be able to raise the money to enforce this stuff well, without Well, again, think taxes? about it. When you talk about businesses that 
there's in business itself there's a concept called goodwill. Goodwill is a customer's perception of the business that they're doing business with. Now, if a company wants to conduct fraudulent business or a dishonest business, there's a cost to doing business in a dishonest way, and there the market will truly decide whether a business is deserving of their business. And so, typically, in reality, enforcement comes from the consumer themselves. When you expect a certain expectation, and it's betrayed by your uh, supplier or your the brand, then you will abandon that brand. So the market is typically the best way to enforce. But without the requirement, in other words, an honest requirement for full disclosure of what's in the food, uh, it's, it's a non-issue. So the market is self-correcting in that regard. But right now, there's, there's no way to ferret out honest and dishonest uh, uh, suppliers, so to speak. So the market usually, you know, to rely on the government to enforce is kind of crazy, you know, what if they enforce, look at the banking, you know, look at the what's going on all around you and you'll notice that yeah. there's, you know, you make it up as you go along and basically there's zero enforcement, you know, it's crazy to think the government's, you know, what's the worst thing anyone of you can hear? Oh, I'm the government and I'm here to help. So, you know, if there's a requirement for it and people want to be dishonest, the market will take care of, you know, with self-correcting. All right. Well, I appreciate you answering the hot, most hostile questions I could think of. That was hostile? <laughs> you know, the other and, crazy, uh, let me share one thing before I let you go. The crazy, I worked on the label GMO uh, uh -huh. campaign last fall. Yeah, I think I was at the house for that. Yeah. Well, the craziest thing I can share with anyone that watches this video is the total lack of, of knowledge as to what a GMO even is. Oh, well, yeah, what's the definition exactly? Right? Well, what a GMO is, technically, is it's called a genetically modified organism. And it's, and everyone that watches this video is probably aware that over the centuries we've used uh, select crop selection, uh, splicing of, uh, you know, different crops together and hybridization of sorts, but a GMO is genetically modified organisms where they actually take genetic sequences from other species, let's say insect strands from an insect that creates a natural pesticide, they isolate the gene sequence and then they put it in the, in the crop to generate that desired characteristic. And uh, for, so that was number one. And then further, you know, uh, people are so oh, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. But if people knew that their maximum testing on any genetically modified organism on the market today has at maximum 90 days of testing, one might find that absurd. And then furthermore, uh, other people, if you're a researcher, because uh, recent changes in the patent law have made it such that uh, uh, once you have a genetic sequence that you own, it's basically your intellectual property. So if I'm, I'm an independent researcher and I want to do testing on this particular uh, seed or crop, uh, bottom line is I am infringing on their intellectual property rights as, as given to them through patent law. So, you know, there's a huge financial motivation to not necessarily do testing. There's no expectation that there's any real life uh, testing uh, and so on and so forth. So we find ourselves in a truly, truly ludicrous situation. Well, hopefully we won't find ourselves in a position where everybody is aware of your concerns because everybody's turned into a zombie. Well, um, I, don't, I don't know about yeah. zombieism, but the yeah. uh, <laughs> long and the short of it is, you know, if you look around at the health statistics in the United States as we speak, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. And yeah, we're being things are changing really fast. And it, But no one's asking questions and, you know, by labeling GMOs it allows people to make a choice at the grocery store, do they want yeah. to participate in that experiment or not? All right. Well, much appreciate the time. Yeah, and if you ever have any questions, I'll give you my card and you can feel free to call. Awesome, thanks. You know? The old world is collapsing, and it's going to take its slave driver governments with it. But what will rise up in their place? In New Hampshire, the Shire Society has a plan, a thriving web forum, and a history of action. Didn't take long to come up with a plan. You can sign up right now at shiresociety.com.